We have uh, uh, the great and powerful Oz on the show, uh, yes. Lorne Michaels. The became the unintentional star of the podcast because he's the touchstone for all the Saturday Night Live people is Lorne Michaels. Yeah, the common denominator. The Yeah, the touchstone, the common denominator, the... Touch... Detonator. Detonator. The thing that everyone talks yeah. about a lot, that's more unwieldy than the touchstone. But we were thrilled to get him yeah. and um, it- uh, He's our most commonly asked guest. When will you have Lorne? When will you have Lorne? And he was very uh, cool to do this because he doesn't do a lot of stuff and he doesn't like to be bothered. And uh, I wouldn't either. You got, he's got a lot going on. Yeah, I took a chance. I called him up at home and I said, Lorne, hi, this is Dana. And Don't uh, hang up. we'd love you to come on the uh, talk on our podcast. Mm -hmm. And he goes, I don't know who this is, but uh, <laughs> no, I don't know. So I can't even do it. No, he was great. So he comes in and he came to the house and did it. And, uh, it, you know, it really reminded me of being back at SNL because me, you, him, it's mm -hmm. like sitting at read through or sitting in a meeting and you have that reverence for him and uh, you want to make him laugh. He's like a father figure in a weird way, you know. A lot of. Pretty much everything mm -hmm. I've had is based on SNL and him keep me on there. So he's he's interesting, very interesting, interesting guy to talk to. He's as smart as they come. And I don't know, I, I probably should have brought up my Lauren impression, but I've talked to him about it off mic uh, before at a restaurant, how I, then I got him at, you know, in 86 when he was in during the, uh, trying to pick the show. Mm -hmm. I still have no fucking first act. And that was the first time I got his rhythm. And then we talk about Lornisms on the show. Yeah. You know, you never leave a hit. And he, he's a brilliant guy. I mean, he really uh, is fun to listen to. You know what's a funny one? I can't say who it was, but someone we know did a movie and uh, he was a pretty big star and it, and it hmm. opened very poorly. And I was in a limo with Lorne and I go, uh, do you think he'll get another movie? And he goes, well, not every studio wants to lose $30 million and work with an asshole. Some do. Not all of them. Well, that's kind of his humor. Yeah, that's, it, that's exactly a good Lorne humor. This is, this is what Lorne would say, his sense of humor. So we're, we're at the meeting, and it's the last show. And you go, oh, this is our last show. We have a two-week break. So it'd be like really, really nice if the show was really good. Instead of a bad show, you know, you would do well, that. No one take like, a dive tonight. We have <laughs> we're being reviewed. <laughs> so you know, he's a just a fascinating yeah. character, and we got to sit with him for for a long and time. And he proved to be very fascinating. Everything, and we everything he said, we hung on. Hey, we didn't talk over. Keep talking. Just hey, keep, hey, we, we, we didn't, didn't even talk over. Yeah, Dana. <laughs> we didn't even. Visit, <laughs> so we didn't. We, we had reverence for, him. for not talking over the guests. Yeah. Because uh, he's a great storyteller, and uh, we get into a lot of things. We get into the current cast and 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 his emotional relationship with cast members, and how long he has been there. Fiftieth anniversary it's never happened up. before in the history of television. A guy yeah. producing a show for a half century. So it's an amazing. You were incredible in this interview, David. I have to say, Dana, you really sparkled. <laughs> All right, here he is, our uh, main man, main man, Lorne Michaels. Conan's got some money coming in. Um, we first of all, we want to thank you for coming in. You're uh, responsible for pretty much everything in my life. Yes. In the yeah. uh, comedy world. First, we have world. to embarrass you and thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We had no plan for this podcast, this no meeting. This won't be in any way used. No, we'll be, we'll cut it's this It's not podcast. used or aired. <laughs> but to our surprise and delight, everyone who was on the podcast started talking and saying nice things about you, how yeah. much they love you. So we just thought, well, can we get him to come on? So here Very we are. Nice. Well, I, I haven't done anything else. Yeah, That's the amazing part. Yeah. But as I said, I have a background in radio. <laughs> <laughs> so. Ratty chips. Um, healthy no. little crackers. Just so Lauren's getting I'm snacks. Just, what will make the least noise? Because radio. <laughs> Do we open the chips? <laughs> make a lot of noise and then not as much noise. Do you like flaming hot? I don't know if that's I, for I'm you. I'm just reaching for You'll whatever's take anything? closest. Anything? Yes. Don't yeah. worry about the noise. Don't worry about the noise and we'll... Um, I'm sorry. And there's protein bars if Ooh. you're stuck. So if you're really stuck, just grab those. Those are <laughs> not too bad. I'll just talk to Dana for a while. Are you staying at the Beverly Hills Hotel? I am. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, in the Margarita Room? Davidson's or? there because they're doing this show, Bupkis. 
Oh, okay. But, but really, you have, you have touchstones. A, One is the Beverly Hills Hotel, mm -hmm. which you're a huge fan of. In Aspen, you stay at the what? Aspen was more houses, I okay. think. St. Bart's is another touchstone. Yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. of course, am I going to set? Yeah. I remember when- And uh, now Maine. Oh, uh, you did finally pull the trigger. Maine? Yeah. Maine. I wasn't CC'd on that. Mm -hmm. So Maine- I'll show your pictures. That's pretty far out but there. I don't think- You can't uh, show them. We talked about that last them. time. As you there? get a little older, you're pretty young. You want to get into the country and you want to get in wide open spaces. And, and you want to get to the landscape of your childhood. Yes. And this is as close to Canada as you can get without going to Canada. Oh, is that what it nice. is? Nice. Okay. You get sort of, yeah, you're Canadian. So, and what part of Canada, just real quick? Uh, Toronto. What part is this near or what part? Toronto? But you were sort of Toronto, am I Toronto, right? Yeah. I told you, Dana. But um, I, I left in 1972. <laughs> It's changed yes. since then. Yes. And is was the reason we did Tommy Boy in Toronto because of that, or was it a tax thing? No, I think that was, mm. Paramount was just, they would have done it in Budapest if it was cheaper. Yeah. yeah. That's usually mm. where movies flow. What was the cost of Tommy Boy versus Wayne's World 1? I just want to know <laughs> about. We were, we were 13.5 or something? Yeah. Yeah, or on, 12, on Wayne's World. 35 days of filming. And which film is your personal favorite it, between we, those we two? We were 35 or I think we're more like 25. Oh, could have been. It yeah. seemed like 25 like that. 25 million? No, 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 no. 25 days of shooting. Oh, yeah. Very quick. One yeah. take. Penelope Spheris. Towards the end, uh, when Howard Howard Koch uh, Junior? was- Junior? Yeah. Hawk Koch. Hawk Koch. Uh, <laughs> was, uh, they were doing the board and, and uh, Paramount person that I was- uh, who's giving us directions and, mm -hmm. you know, if you can make this movie for 12.5, I'll leave you alone. And that was sort of the whole idea of it. Mm -hmm. And then we had an extra day or two. And at one point, the Rob Lowe character was going to have <laughs> Dennis Hopper as a father. <laughs> and uh, so that, that there was a dynamic between the mm -hmm. two of them, which would play off in the sense of the counterpoint. And then they said, you have to don't have the extra two days. So oh, that went away. to use Mike Myers phrase, we smushed it uh, <laughs> into one character. And that was Rob. Oh, okay. And he was great. Mm -hmm. Kurt Fuller. That was, ended up, ended up being lightning in a bottle. I only saw the previews and I remember been told before where the Paramount guy came back. They, we did the previews. Mike and I are possessed while they're watching ourselves. We're kind of depressed. Oh, probably and John he says, Goldman. it's got Ghostbusters numbers. Let's eat. Right. That's what he's, is that no, right? we were no? in a restaurant. We were, <laughs> okay. No, how then, did you yeah, remember Because I was older. Um, <laughs> I was we dressed in, as Garth. So. We, we did, for sentimental reasons, a preview in Wayne, New Jersey, because it had a I multiplex. I think that's where it was. Yeah. And then we went to a restaurant that was, was happening in Soho, which had a tin roof. And uh, everybody was ordering. Mike was in complete depression because <laughs> it wasn't the movie he thought he wanted. You know, it was all that. And mm -hmm. he said... It got an 86, let's eat. 86, okay. Yeah. I missed 86 it by nine for those points. of you at home is higher than 80. There's two boxes, so it means yeah, most that a top people two are in boxer? the top yeah. two boxes. Yes. And also that it added up to that. I, it could be 88, it could be 91, but it was something right. where he thought, why would you want to keep talking? <laughs> oh, we got like we won. We're, we yeah, got we it, won. Yeah. We yeah, won. Take the yeah. win. And uh, that was sort of... It took Amazing. Mike a while to get used to it, and then he went into the editing room, and and uh, but it was all there. It was all there in that first cut, and mm -hmm. part of it was just how fast it moved and the exuberance mm -hmm. of it. And as I say, most people in America, when they when they're choosing any kind of entertainment, the phrase "looks like fun" is the most Helps, yeah. is the, is the top. And I know. figured out for myself later why. Yeah so popular and I thought the two so-called losers in town they drop AMC pace they're with their parents are having way more fun yeah. than anyone in the town yeah. so that's like who wouldn't want to live in that world I and Tommy Boy I remember you took me to Chili's after and um is that no, what we're no, it wasn't quite well, as Tommy nice. Boys no, was wait, made for thirty-five million. No, no Tommy Boys probably around the same like mm -hmm. same thing. Well, same same it was always from the studio. It was always you know these movies have to be made for a price. You know, fifteen twenty million dollars is a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. And then you go, well, we can do this for twenty. No, no, I said fifteen to twenty. We don't, we'll <laughs> aim, we're going to aim for for fifteen, but we may end up at twenty. But um, but once that happened, you were left alone. 
I think because nobody considered it important, which is mm-hmm. a, a big plus. Yeah. You know, and I could watch Tommy Boy and be really comfortable because I'm not worrying or seeing myself. Yeah. And just thought it was the start of David's film career. But sure. for Chris, it feels to me like it captured Chris completely. Yeah. Yeah. Like his physical and got, comedy, and, and his and got the sentimental side, which was kind of him fighting for the walk through the factory sure. and the scene in the boat and and the bagpipes. Yes, that yeah. was great. It's like Three Amigos. It yeah. just gets shinier and brighter, as Paul and, would say. And also, they're meant to be fun. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And everyone, I think when somebody asked me in an interview about Waynesboro, what were you aiming for? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know, uh, really a confection. You know, because I mm-hmm. said, uh, in a Marx Brothers movie, no one cares whether Fidonia won the war. <laughs> you know, it's, it's going to go, as, it's going to go 80, 90 mm-hmm. minutes. It's going to be as funny as it can be. Yeah. And then it's going to, good night. And, uh, and everybody's happy. And right. so the idea that you're going to be tied to a plot and have to stick with scenes that didn't work because they're going to tell the story, as opposed to, uh, you know, Wayne's Rose Boy. Boy has show boy loses show boy sees <laughs> yeah. girl boy. Boy's I mean, listen, to, yeah. Tommy boy. We always say like, if you went and pitched a movie of two guys selling brake pads in Ohio, yeah, we got to do this. <laughs> of course, like, it just really. I think it was Lauren saying uh, these two are kind of funny around the office, and I think you told the Turners, Bonnie and Terry Turner, uh-huh. like, can you write something about that? And it was you they would great. get how we were goofy around the office, and then said if you can, and they did a good job of doing that. And then you kind and of there'd be a it. moment or two in Coneheads too. Yeah. Yeah, which had already established. Yeah. And Mike, mm-hmm. despite the best efforts of, you know, Mike and Dana, was in Wayne's World. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we had a bit of, we had a bit of a competition. Yes. <laughs> That's what Paul would say about I, him there and was, John. You heard cheers of the audience and then they were yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we've lived long enough to be yes. very Generous. good friends yes. and love each other. The one thing I put I, of my notes to ask you, why did you cast me? What was originally at the show? <laughs> yeah, on yeah. SNL. Well, because there was no Garth. There was only Wayne. At the the, start. The, the, but yeah. I mean, why did you cast me on SNL? <laughs> oh, in SNL. <laughs> no, I can well, answer that's this. A, that was a huge spot, you know. And yeah. then you took me, and you didn't take a lot of brilliant people. Was so it Jim Carrey. I'm very grateful for it. But no, I didn't see know. Jim Carrey. Uh, uh, Frank and Davis. Oh, they someone else. Saw, they and seen somebody him. else. And yeah. said, they said it's too big for you. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I would, looking you back, let me make it. the decision. Well, I think you did cast it. I don't know if like a situation comedy, but like it was different. Lovitz was a flavor. Phil was a, a role, and somehow I fit in there. And you rolled the dice, and I'm ever grateful for it. But it seems at the time I did not have a lot of confidence. I didn't know what was going to happen. You know. Well, I think Lovitz was there from the year before. Yeah, he was the there kingpin was that at the Twilight time. Twilight Zone cruel thing. That, uh, <laughs> you burnt the cast. Uh, yes, exactly. Oh, yeah. Everyone right. got burnt yeah. up in a fire. That, I think <laughs> that was Frank. And, and I, like, Lauren was, like, I sort of yeah. just skimmed yeah. that sketch. I didn't yeah. really. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I sort of knew uh, you'd fit from. Thank uh, God. <laughs> Uh, what was the name of the club? Igby's? You saw... Well, Igby's. that was... For yeah. people who don't know, but now I'm here with Lauren. Yeah. I had auditioned other times. They said, you were coming around. I didn't want to do it at the comedy store. And then Rosie O'Donnell was there. I got 40 minutes. Yeah. I'm waiting to go on. First of all, I'm terrified. Right. Because it's a dream, like everyone else. You come through the door. There he is. Then Brandon Tartikoff, the head of the network. Tartar sauce. And then I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm so nervous. And then Cher. <laughs> and they sat down in the club. Now you're, welcome you're, Dana you're, Florey. You're, you're, I'm at Igby's. So I, was, I, I, that was probably my only night with the two of them. But, <laughs> I know. But, but, but we were nerves. somewhere. And they, mm-hmm. I think Cher said, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm going to go see somebody I think is good in the club. <laughs> oh, I'll come. And then Brandon went, well, I, I want to go too. Or he was first. I don't remember the order. but yeah. uh, And they mm-hmm. all laughed. Uh, but that wasn't the deciding factor. <laughs> it was just that, that for me. you had uh, clear, I mean, you were funny. And, and you can never much, anytime you talk about funny for longer than a minute, you're no, not it, funny, it, it's not good. Yeah. It's still whimsical that I found myself to that place at that time. No, and also I'd never been there before, probably yeah. since. And uh, as I said, I haven't been with those people either. Mm-hmm. But uh, I do know Cher, I guess. And but, when I've run into her, she says, I was there when you were discovered. Yeah, no, no, but she, anyway. she, with her laugh was so open yes. and, and nice. And mm-hmm. uh, she just wanted 
everyone everyone to win. Yeah. yeah. Also, if Dane is doing, uh, I don't mean to jump in, but if he's doing church lady chopping broccoli, things that literally in your head you could probably just pluck and put right on the show. If there's first show, nothing. Yeah. The, to do different. the whimsy of the church lady, because it was part of the set, is probably five minutes of the yeah. character. And then I remember, like, okay, we'll try it. it. Who knew? And I worked with your ex-wife, Rosie Schuster, for a month. You you assigned me to a writer. Yeah. She was the one who said, church chat, because we thought of a talk show. Yeah, and I remember funny. bringing the two dresses into you. One was a little more feminine, and you just pointed to the one we used. Yeah. <laughs> and then as it turns out, it was such a great thing for the show because I had Phil and Jan coming in and being brilliant and, and or Sigourney Weaver, the first show, and or, Victoria Jackson. Yeah. And so also perfect. Sean Penn. And then Sean Penn and then all yeah. these religious scandals. So yeah. the, again, that was a freaky, lucky thing for, for all uh, of us. I think it was like very often with the character, uh, you have to find, or at least my end of it is, mm-hmm. you have to find the context. Uh, you know, with with Mike and, and, and you in, in Wayne's world, it was like, he had a very specific look in mind, mm-hmm. which was the basement, mm-hmm. stairs coming down. Nora played the mother. Yes. Um, <laughs> Hair metal thing. He went, didn't quite, the guard thing was, I think you should do it with Dana, and, and somehow that evolved. That was your suggestion. Yeah, yeah for but sure. He, and then the moment it worked, it was like on a 10 to 1, and mm-hmm. it played, played pretty yeah. well, because uh, it was fresh and had energy, and yeah. it looked like fun, and it was. Um, and then after that, Mike had been at the show three months, four months. Uh, yeah, something like that. Or- but after that, it was like, why are we in that corner? Right. Yeah. And you're in that corner because <laughs> you designed a set that had the stairs and, and whatever. And an, an exit. exit. You're as far yeah. from the audience as possible. So yes. from that point on, I think it moved to home base. And, yes. And that was like, yeah, we don't which, need the background. Right. Which These is incredibly characters. powerful home base to be at is home right base. in front yeah. of the uh, You can really time, time the laughs. Where yeah. the monologue is. Mm. Where the monologue is. I'm just yeah. telling people at home. Yeah. Yes. Where it's like yeah. right can, at the audience, right down the and camera. As the warm up, which is, was designed a certain way, it is still the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're you're moving down, you know, like somebody's, Somebody does now. It's, it's Che, right? Uh, and then Keenan comes out and sings <laughs> mm-hmm. with the girls, and then you sort of the lights start to go down, and you know you're looking at that spot, yeah, or you're looking where the cold opening is going to be. You're trained, you, you're, and so you get a sense of where the focus it's is. It's just amazing, yeah. Lauren. Uh, that you're, you're still there, and I, I've come back a few times and did update or whatever. You can't get past it. I mean, you'll never forget it. And I think that for all of us who are unknown, go on the show, and for the audience to see Will Ferrell do what he did, see how David evolved. Yeah. It's such an amazing visceral experience. There's nothing like it. And the music and the way you kept it the same is extraordinary, that you didn't let any regime trick you out and change it. What's interesting is there's four new people coming in. And it's and amazing. Because of the <laughs> pandemic, we couldn't let – there was no place for everyone to go. So we kept adding people because you have to add people every year. <laughs> and suddenly we have like 23 <laughs> people. Because like, of the pandemic. Yeah, no, take and, them off and the and Zoom. And everybody's angry because they're not getting enough playing time. <laughs> yeah. and, and so uh, – and then people left. And and so it was so much fun seeing these these new people because mm. they're they're exactly where you should start. They've never been on television. They don't yes. know. They don't generally. If they have representation, it's primitive, mm-hmm. and uh, mm. you just sort of see them. And there's like that exuberance and excitement, and uh, and there it just shows, and that energy shows. And so when you when you start with people who've never been on television, and yeah. the audience gets to be part of that process. And live with them through it. Yeah. Then I, I used to say, I'm going to say it now again, um, that the four longest years of your life are high school. Yes. <laughs> you don't have any money. You don't have a car. Any girls. And so staying <laughs> up late with friends or staying up late with, mm-hmm. by yourself to like one o'clock in the morning is yeah. like a really exciting <laughs> thing. So when people say – the best cast that ever did it. Mm-hmm. Generally, it's when they were in high school. Totally. So if they, you know, and they go, oh well, no, the best was you know you and Hartman and you, yeah. you know, when you go and follow. 
And yeah. then you go, when were you in high school? <laughs> yeah. you go, oh, exactly. No, I mean, yeah, it, no, there's no, just, no, it's no, true. And you have the time. Yeah. And you talk about with your friends. That's the only game in town. Yeah. Especially mm-hmm. back then, like that. I mean, there's more competition now, and it's great that you're still yeah. crushing it because with so many things to choose from, that was, I think when you have a transition kind of now where some are leaving that, you know, more familiar faces. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean anyone's not as good. It's just some people get more opportunities coming up. Yeah. And the same thing happened. It took me longer to get my footing when we had Dana. It, it, unfortunately, it was just too good. It was- Oh, no. And also, I back, think Ben Stiller came in at the same time as Mike did. Yes. But he sort of saw, this could be a long wait. <laughs> you know, like, because yeah. Sandler, everybody was there mm-hmm. and it was uh, killing it. And, yeah. uh, and what was interesting about that time- was the only people who liked it were the audience. Critically, it wasn't it never so it didn't now. It's a, gold, hated, it's a golden yeah. age now. Yeah, we but, were not you know, like, like now, Barstool Sports and, said we were a great cast. We were the yeah. best cast. And then you back then, they were like, this is the worst bunch of assholes. <laughs> Untalented Even homes. when we had, on a given night back in the late 90s, or early 90s, sorry, late 80s, yeah. we would have Tunes's. I'm talking about just, we'd have a Sprockets. <laughs> Maybe I'd do How Bush or Perot or McLaughlin mm-hmm. Group. Mike might do uh, Talking Lady, whatever her name was. But we had so many weapons. Sandra Richmond. would sing a song. David would do a Hollywood Minute. Yeah. So there was a given moment in time. You must have Coffee felt machine. like, hey, I got a lot of and you things know, to hit uh, here. We're doing that documentary on Jim Downey, which- Yeah, uh, I talked to him for four hours. It's yeah. only going to take 10 years. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> awesome. rush, They're going to use three minutes rush, of that. something like that. But my son, Eddie, is working on it. And Great. He, he grew up kind of on the show, et cetera, but, uh, but not, doesn't really know that period. No, and too he, young. And he keeps showing me things from that period that are like hilarious. And one of them he showed me recently was uh, Perot on Larry King. <laughs> and it's so funny. It's Here's a perfect, a perfect Downey piece. You're mm-hmm. great at it. Will, <laughs> Will was great. Will was doing Larry King, doing which it. he's not known for. Someone and there was Chris Larry Kattan King. in there. It was people, their platforms were very exotic. And Ross Perot was the same old thing. Because he's <laughs> same old dribble every time. And we're going to do this. Can I finish one time? That's or are you going to keep talking all the time? <laughs> I mean, the rhythm of that. Was so infectious. Perfect. I never had more fun doing a character. And you could do that speed. Mm-hmm. You always had that ability. That was something I saw in the audition. You could you could move something that fast. If it if I can catch a wave with it rhythmically in my yeah. head, and I know that it's like casting a line to the audience. Can and, I finish one time? Yeah. yeah. And I know Little that hooks, you're going to laugh hooks. right now because you can't not laugh because yeah. that's the way I'm talking. Can yeah. you figure it that way? With I know it's, it is exactly like a song. Yeah. yeah. Ex- Extrapolate. But you were. You audition with music. I did have I did have a little piano thing <gasps> and stuff. Oh. But I'm not recommending that because it's really time. I, know, I was about to but, say for uh, that reason. I'm uh, out. The other night, just I was at the improv doing a benefit, and I'm kind of bomby. I mean, I'm not. I'm doing okay. Yeah. And then I go fuck it. I go. I did a thing on SNL called Chopping Broccoli. It's packed, so I do it and give it all my all on the piano. Standing ovation. So. I should never mm-hmm. go and on and do anything else. It killed. Yeah, I thought that story was heading to it. I only did it Who once. Who do they think it is? Because people ask me all the time. <laughs> it was, we gave him a name. To me, it was just random Nigel rock star. Yeah. What was he called? Derek something. Uh, yeah, but, so it's Brit. It's a but British. It's not, but it's not McCartney. No. No, it's not McCartney. And then I buried it, but we did a sketch where the record company, it was a little too sophisticated, <laughs> tells him he has to die. Because his record sales will go up, and look what happened to Jim Morrison and Hendrix. But I, I yeah. don't want to die. You know, it's one of those, <laughs> and it laid there. But Chuck Broccoli <laughs> lives on. You know, Lauren, when you when you watch these auditions, it's interesting because I was newer to comedy. All I wanted to do was kill, and because I my audition was different. We've we've interviewed a lot of these people, and I'm hearing a lot of more at eight H, which would be just horrifying. But. Uh, and it's dead silent, you know, and everyone's out there and shoemakers eating peanuts. You know, no one, it's, it's like, hey, come it's, down for the audition. It's, a, it's right. tough to audition. But when well, I but did, also, weren't you brought in a little bit as a writer? Well, the, the thing was, I came in and Dennis, right before I walked on, people were at Catch Rising Star. You might've been there. I don't actually don't even know if you were there. It was, you know, some writers came down and a handful it was me, Rob Schneider and Tom Kenny. And we were just doing stand-up. So yeah, I was we do it. And Dennis Miller comes up before and he goes, hey, Spudling. He goes, well, you, you're going to bring the A game? And I go, I mean, I, it's all the A I got. I mean, I don't know. It might <laughs> be a B. B but not saving any My a, best yeah. is might be B. Yeah. And he goes, uh, yeah, I go, I'm saving it for another audition. <laughs> uh, uh, for American uh, uh, Idol. So I go, listen, um, 
Yeah, and he goes, you don't want to kill too hard. Throws a red flag with these guys. They don't want to get some road hack. And I go, so don't do good. And they're like, David Spade. I go, Dennis, <laughs> don't do good, so, do good. I go, but I realize now when I watch comics and stuff, I look at writing. So I can tell someone has game in two lines. You know what I mean? It's like name that tune. I go, first line might be a fluke. And then they do the next no. joke. And I go, there's something going on here. No. And it's like, um, you get an eye for it. So I think you guys all had that. And it and I can watch someone and not see if they kill or not. I don't even almost hear it. I just go, oh, that's a good one. Oh, that's a good one. So Dennis said later, or maybe Downey said, no, we liked your writing. So I don't even know. I don't think we did that well, but that didn't matter. It was more mm. like, oh, I like the way you put that together or that thought or that. And that, I How appreciate How would you that. describe that? That sensibility that you look for? Well, uh, uh, what I think was happening then was we had a kind of murderer's row of people yeah. that were going to be dominating for a long time. Yeah. So you were going to get to be Ross Perot, but in the on other the debate. <laughs> and on the wide <laughs> shot. Well, well, that was my tombstone. He was going to come back. <laughs> I he was going to come back bad. and do both parts. <laughs> I saw David sitting in the corner, dressed as Perot, <laughs> so, and he looked so sad, but it was just for the wide shot. It was a fluky thing, but yeah, yeah that was, you did but, well. But what I'm getting at is <laughs> that there's- <laughs> You were Perot. There's a thing which I've done a bunch over the years, which is I'll bring someone in as a writer. You know they're you know they're going to be cast eventually. You buy some they, time, yeah. but they won't go through that self doubt. Mm -hmm. of why am I not getting on? And people say I'm on, but I you know I don't see enough. Whatever. I added that though yeah. to my stress. People, <laughs> I'll I talk to comedians who've auditioned, and they tell me what they've auditioned with in the last five or eight years. Yeah, and I won't tell them, but I'm thinking to myself, I'm not going to get it. Yeah, and whether it was. Like, you're not afraid of any kind of humor, but it was something scatological, but it wasn't funny. And I could just tell it didn't fit kind of the frequency right. of you, Lauren Michaels, right. and your lieutenants. There's yeah. a certain thing, and I it's hard to describe it because it's it's got a wide bandwidth, but there is something You that, can see it at read-through when someone new puts in something, everyone goes, oh, Jesus. And it's no, a little yeah. off-putting. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and read-through is an honest room. Yeah. There's no, yeah. Bernie's not there, you know, like, so there's not, and, and the in, <laughs> network's not there, or there, there's no booming laugh, right. you know, from, so it's got, it's, yeah. It's, yeah, it didn't play. And same with the show, when something doesn't work, there are no laughs on the air, so. Yeah, who do you blame? That's, that's the high it's, wire. It's the fairest thing yeah. in the world, yeah, really. No. And it, also you feel you burned it. Yeah. But there are people like Bowen I brought in as a writer, He's great. Uh, and there's, you want people to see how the process works because it's figuring it out those first few weeks that, you know, that's it and that's cut, you know, yeah. like that. And how fast it goes and mm -hmm. costume changes and uh, the, Molly's pointing at a, yeah. a line that changed yeah. or the writer forgot to tell you. I think Chris Rock ran into that problem of, you know, we were – stressed that we and frustrated we weren't getting on fast enough but chris rock comes in and he, they're like you're eddie murphy now and you're on in seven sketches and frank and screaming at him about a confederate he's playing a general <laughs> and he's going no and i'm like poor rock he's in too much like it's too much right away yeah and here's the cards and here's this well and i think it, it got him off it was a tougher situation for the guy who's one of the funniest yeah in the world. but you knew I mean, at least I knew he was really good. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and of course. But normally you get to develop in the background. Right, you watch a little bit. Yeah. Phil and Jan and I were in the cold opening, and I'd never done sketch comedy, just stand up. Yeah. So my first show, and I wasn't, I didn't realize later, I guess I knew I was before the monologue, but I didn't, I didn't know I was in the cold opening. Right. That's how green I was. We were just in the first one. It was Game show psychic. I don't know if it was Jack Handy. <laughs> Is that what it was? <laughs> Jack Handy. Jack Handy. <laughs> Sounds uh, funny. You know, already. I would answer the questions, and Phil was a perfect uh, yeah. in Jan. And so we had no time to really acclimate, but it was kind of nice. Everyone was really involved. But this is something Higgins said, and I don't know if you made it, but that you basically wrote the Constitution. <laughs> Of Saturday Night Live, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then you see all these incarnations. So I'm a baby boomer. I'm doing late '80s stuff, yeah. and then you you're the constant. And then you're seeing what kind of Will Ferrell stuff or Bill Hader humor, and then Kate McGinnon. And so you're adaptive oh, yeah. in a sense. You're observing. So are these new four people, are you seeing something just yeah, a little 2022? Uh, one of them, by the way, is from Arizona. Shut At, the fuck you up. Know, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, yeah. That's where David Spade's from. <laughs> I thought, famous. <laughs> they told you it was like a credit. Scottsdale Junior he said, well, we, we, we were yeah. a little. We got only one. But and you. also the changing culture of nice. comedy. But you're still there, and you're adapting, right? I mean, yeah, and and I think the room is great. 
you know, the and, best. and, mm-hmm. and uh, in it age, you know. Oh yeah, and nothing so like it. hallowed it's grounds. A, and it's a safe space. Mm-hmm. So you kind of, people relax into it. I mean, it's scary for the auditions, of course. Yeah. But it's also, at some point you have to bat at Yankee Stadium if you're gonna be in the major league. So pretending that that won't exist and you go right from a club to on the air wouldn't yeah. work. That, no. Passing through that threshold, because it's scary. And for you personally, because I always saw you kind of as a coach in yeah. a way. Mm-hmm. That so every but every literally cast, what Jason every, Sudeikis calls me. You're always uh-huh. doing sports metaphors. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you complimented me once. Third person said, uh, uh, "Lauren said you reminded him of Don Mattingly." <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, "That," and I looked it up. Take yeah. it. But you. You you see all these personalities come and go, and have you gotten more astute or that he surprised you? You kind of go, well, this cast member will be like this. I think this one's going to do well later. I mean, you must have some intuitive sense, or is it all just sort of surprising sometimes? I mean, like of these four you've just hired, right? Well, you know, do you have a sense about, of uh, maybe ten years ago, uh, somebody who was new to the network, but you know, like. Uh, was a senior person. We were having dinner, and he said, "Can I ask you an SNL question?" And I went, <laughs> "Well, that's nice." Sure. No, it was great. And I, he said, "You know the update with Jost and Che? Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think that's working?" <laughs> and I said, "No." He said, "Oh, you know?" And I went, "Yeah, no, no. It, it's a, it's a thing of mm-hmm. like." The way I say it, which is unpleasant, is that all babies are ugly unless they're your baby. (laughs) And after three months, people say, what a beautiful baby. Mm -hmm. And you have to live through that Mm -hmm. period of people not being good. Somebody blows a line. Somebody comes in on the wrong foot. Somebody gets a cue late. Wally doesn't, the card Mm -hmm. doesn't come up. It's all that. And people go, I I don't think that guy's that funny. And you go, no, he is. And I think when you see chemistry and you sort of know they're going to work well together. Mm. Well, you and, you and Chris, yeah. you know, it was just there from the beginning. It was there off stage, but it was also very clear on camera. Mm. Well, it seems like the audience starts to discover you and like you because you get enough bass hits. And then you as a performer and David, we just get more confident right. and that feeds on itself. Also, you go from however successful you thought you were to famous. And that yeah. transition is just different. Suddenly... In the in the first season, we had a limo for the host. That was the, <laughs> that was the extent of our budget. Yeah. But uh, and at the party, uh, John Belushi would quite often go and sit with the host towards the end, and then uh, as they're getting into the, the limo, he'd say, "You know, go with." So John would say, "I'll drop you off," and uh, he'd drop, <laughs> drop the host at the at the hotel, and then he would Take just drive car. around all night. With his face, like people, limos were rare then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So who is that? And then he'd just be, you know, hand on the roof. Yeah, fame kind of is. I like when we, first of all, we didn't have cars back then. Yeah. It wasn't that far long ago. But Mm-mm. to the to the set, which probably was better be, to have because it's snowing and they're like, yeah. Marcy's like, Spit, are you here? I'm down at Manny Hanny. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I, I'm trying to get there. I live on Upper West Side. <laughs> But in snowstorm, and then I get there, and then afterwards we got to share. Like you know, made sense. Cast yeah. gets a car, mm-hmm. I'd share one with any feature player, or whatever. And then, uh, and Norm would take one to Atlantic City, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> where he did very well. Yeah, where he did very well. <laughs> Marcy's like, um, I'm telling Lauren immediately. Uh, but <laughs> well, I was going to ask you about. You just said something about Farley. Do you remember the stupid story where Farley was? Um, dating uh, Aaron at work and uh, yeah, I remember that this is just someone that worked at the office very uh, nice uh, mm-hmm. very cute girl and then on the break they broke up and, then, and they came back and she started dating Steve Martin yeah. and so <laughs> Farley comes back from Wisconsin and uh, Sandler and I are in the office and he goes so uh, he's smoking I hear uh, Aaron's got a new fella and I go yeah but he doesn't know and he goes well he might be richer but he's not funnier and he's not better looking, and he's not more famous. And we were like, e. whoops, <laughs> all three. <laughs> and he's like, shut the fuck up. We're like, oh. Ooh. you can't get better than see Martin. That's no. a tough one. Yeah. So, so Lauren. Yeah. So Lauren, I have a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Look at this. Um, it seems to me like you love it 
when the cast and the writers are melding, you don't want either side to really dominate completely? I think I made the choice because when I worked on the show Laugh In, which was a number Laugh one show, and I, Huge. Which, to which I contributed almost nothing. But I was a, <laughs> I was a junior writer, yeah. but we were never at any read through. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't go to the studio. We the, were in the oh, writing so just write and pass it and, and then pass that's it. it. And other people mm -hmm. would rewrite yeah. it and whatever. So you, it wasn't what I thought working at a comedy show would be. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of elevating the writers, because every every person from the network, and particularly everyone in the control room, goes, oh, the writers can do no wrong. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the point with it is, it's that collaboration between a performer and a writer is... And then the performers all learn how to write. Do you know what I mean? Or at least how to recognize because the to performers survive. know rhythm and timing. You know, that's mm -hmm. too many words. Cut yeah. that back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And the the writer's theoretically thinking about content of some sort. They don't like to trim. Yeah. No, they do I would not tell like to Al trim. and Jim, I go with a bush cold opening, I go, You gotta cut some words out because I feel like I'm doing homework. Can't do I feel like pages. I have to get through it. And they, they they did it, but yeah, it was and and they do it immediately because they never yeah. talk back. They never ever argue uh, with you or whatever. I didn't realize how much they all wanted to be on camera. Yeah, till that later. And then you saw Change Bank with Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Change Bank was great. Yeah. Silver tones, man. Commercial yeah. parodies were a, a, another secret weapon. I think there's just a thing of watching people on on a stage really enjoying themselves. Mm -hmm. feeling comfortable when that level of confidence is there and you know that you got it. It's just a different thing. And, you, and it comes through at home. You just it's, can tell. It's exhilarating. On the 40th, because Mike and I were closing the show, Yeah, which I want to talk about the 40th because I think it was – sort of magic. But I said, we should either be very offended or very flattered because it's a four hour show and there we come as Wayne and Garth. <laughs> <laughs> and we so happened to land it so beautifully. Perfectly, and yeah. Kanye West was there and we kept going to him and I felt so in the pocket, but God, you had to fight the nerves because everyone was a famous person. Yeah, oh, yeah. In, in that, the that was a tough room. And yet, and worse, uh, because the seating was screwed up. Well, I don't want to blame Well, him, the 40th was just a fly by the seat of your pants. I mean, it wasn't right, a normal. But people were still coming in and, uh, you know, and I had to send to Jimmy the... and, and uh, Justin out. So they really took a bullet, you know, because like, oh, people were oh. moving in, still seating and they're performing. Because the audience was only celebrities, right? Yeah. yeah. And it was only live cast at 8 o'clock. Well, yeah, ho hosts. former hosts, former music. Cast. And yep. then you had a spillover room, and people yep. were mad there in the spillover room. That room was <laughs> pretty famous, that? too. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> and by the way, I don't think there's any plus ones. Yeah. It was just- And the 50th it, will have no plus ones. It's fucking yeah. Well, what do you think of the 50th? I mean, isn't it surreal? Yeah. I, I, every now and then, uh, I was going to- I had to give an Emmy speech, and I hadn't planned on Emmy. Oh, that's right. Congratulations. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You win no, again. No, no, yeah. No, it was great. like seven years in a row or something? Yeah. I mean, Six. Six. Sorry. Six. Good Still. Time. I'm know, thinking about next year. It's a, you have to write this stuff down mm -hmm. later. <laughs> uh, I think I was going to say, you know, like, I don't want to say, well, I'm getting ready for season 48, because it's insane. It's yeah. just, Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and yes, there was five years I wasn't there, you know, after the first five. But it's, you just sort of go, uh, and the other thing that's familiar to people who are joining the show is the school year. Mm -hmm. You know, that that we come in in the fall, we yeah. take Thanksgiving off, we take Christmas off, uh, you know, Easter, whatever, and spring break, and then it's summer, mm -hmm. and you go away. Mm -hmm. And uh, the original plan was not, the network just wanted us to do three shows a month all year round. And I went, the seasons are going to run into each other. And also, it's so, such a pressurized environment. It's beating, yeah. You have to get away from everybody. I mean, for me, because I want to mm -hmm. kill everybody by the end. Oh, yeah. And you it's just brutal. go, want to get out. Yeah. And so you go away, and around the end of July, you go, yeah, I'm I could go back. Start to miss it, yeah. Now, yeah. when the network or the whoever, the people you talk to about the show, yeah. try to convince you to do something, how do you, I mean, if you, how do you navigate that? I mean, have you ever lost a, an argument? Because it seems like you have have a winning yeah. percentage of keeping the show quality or, or it's, it's if brand. If it was anything to do with religion, 
particularly in the 70s. Mm -hmm. There was, Jim used to write this uh, thing called What If? <laughs> uh, and it would yes. always be written in by a 10 year old paper boy from out of Tuna, Illinois. And uh, it would be, What if Spartacus has a, had a Piper Cub? You know, it's like those kind of, right. and then yeah. we do a reenactment of it. Oh, okay. And at the time, a, con a, con a state senator in New York, in arguing for capital punishment, said that if the Romans hadn't believed in capital punishment, there would be no Jesus and there'd be no Christianity, <laughs> which seemed insane to me, but I, I understood how you could get there logically. Thinking, yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the movie Straight Time, which was Dustin Hoffman coming out of, mm -hmm. you know, on parole and the, his yes, criminal right. friends trying to get him back into crime. So we did it as Jesus does, you know, gets off with three to five. And then he, uh, his, some of the apostles are going to come on one more miracle. No one gets hurt. <laughs> and, you know, now to me, it was just comedy, you know, mm -hmm. but it really got, uh, okay. and it, uh, and it, because you'd have to know the relationship between me and Howard, because in the first five years, It'd be like, well, we, we can't just do pop. And I go, well, I, I, I'm, uh, you know, we want to do this. And so that week we had mm -hmm. Keith Jarrett and it was like jazz piano and it was brilliant, mm -hmm. but it was like now this sketch, which was nine minutes, we're arguing up until mm -hmm. air, really at 11 o'clock, at which point it's like, I'm going, uh, <laughs> really? Yeah, you're denying the divinity of Christ, which I go, we're not really. It's you know, <laughs> also a comedy uh, show. Yeah, and maybe that's the Canadian part. But all I'm getting at is it was like uh, an absolute no, not wow. even not not even that. Mm -hmm. And I said to one of the network people who was in the room, who I'll spare, uh, <laughs> I said, does this, uh, does this offend you? And he said, "Listen, Lord, I'd let you put cocksucking on the air if we get a forty share. So <laughs> I, I'm the wrong guy to ask." But I went, oh, this is really helpful. Thank you. <laughs> Well, we had Mr. Clockworthy, I think, yeah. in the in the eighties. Yeah, and yeah, in yeah. church chat, I initially had penis in there a lot, and he wanted some of those cut out. And so I substitute for penis. I put in more penis. your throbbing bulbous yeah. area. It was way more pornographic, but yeah. that's good. No penis. Yeah, and I, I think that for us, you know, uh, because it's live, and because we were on the honor system. At the beginning, we're still on it. Mm -hmm. it. You know, I was at the Emmys the other night, and a, a, a bunch of people, you know, uh, said fuck, and you go, yeah, um, you're going to get a laugh, you know, but is that, it's not going to age well, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but it is that move, mm -hmm. the temptation to do it. And for us, we would lose affiliates, we would lose, I don't mm -hmm. think you lose anything anymore, but, but it, there's something about, and when we were doing Wayne's World, I'd been, in 1990, I was in, anyway, I was on a, a, something, that, a, a trip. <laughs> uh, on a uh, yacht. And, yeah. and I was with people that I wasn't normally with. And they, they talked about watching the show with their kids. Now, no, you know, in the 70s, was no, not supposed to trust anyone over 30. Right. And it was like we were doing it for the people we knew, and we didn't think the rest of the country cared Mm -hmm. And they really didn't until Mr. Bill showed up. But uh, <laughs> and yes. they were talking about sitting there with their teenage daughter and how and uh, how great it was to both be laughing at the same things as a family. Anyway, I didn't have kids, so I, I, it was kind of I thought, oh, that and that's that was good. Schwing and Finkers. No, says it what? was or? we were doing that. <laughs> oh, the Madonna, the Madonna. Oh, thing. yeah. With the Evian bottle. Right. What was, what was the movie, Truth or Dare? Yeah, oh, yeah, Truth or Dare. I was in a unitard. A goes, look, at the, look at the thing on that guy or whatever. Yeah, I was. <laughs> it was and uh, and uh, they were doing the Evian bottle like, yeah. like that. And yeah. she wanted to do Felicio. it. And I'm going, oh, yeah. if I had a 16-year-old daughter, that'd be like really cringe time. Tough, yeah. mm -hmm. And uh, we do lots of things that are shocking, but I think you can't just be shocking. Mm. I think it's great to have guardrails. And so it's a, you can be a little naughty, but you can't yeah. just full-blown. No. I mean, the penis sketch where we were all at a nudist colony. Fantastic piece. 
fantastic piece. Really holds up. Yeah. Didn't it take a year or two to get it on? We lost Toyota. We lost two, three big sponsors because people would boycott a dealership, mm. and then because of that sketch, yeah. yeah, and because people would say, uh, you know, whoever has the dealership in Mississippi is getting is calling central headquarters, going, "There's people outside here protesting," and. Why are you sponsoring that show? And Guys at a nudist works. colony. We had a slat, so you'd see our legs. I think yeah. Hanks was on it. I think it was Smigel, right? Yes. I, and it was just, nice Cohen? penis. How you doing? How's your penis? And we said penis like intentionally like 300 times or something. <laughs> Missed that one. I'm a, no, I'm a, yeah, yeah. Good. yeah, and the reputation of it, it was where the laughs were. But mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't Smigel. think it got great laughs. Right. No. No, I don't think so. But there are certain writers who never don't hear laughs. So <laughs> you never <laughs> don't hear laughs. Yeah, I know they go and kill. Yeah. Actually, but like old old ones like uh, cheeseburger, cheeseburger, Pepsi, Pepsi. They, those I don't think kill the first time around. I don't think Conan's nope. kills the first time around. And you train the audience. This is good. And they and then later they go, oh, those are the best. And you go, it yeah. Didn't even work. Very often the first one's not not a hit. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we did uh, the very first show. We're still trying to find out what areas of the studio had sound, and we were mm -hmm. on there. There was a piece that Rosie wrote uh, called "Be Be Hospital," mm -hmm. and uh, it was a maternity hospital for bees. And the bee, the, Franny Lee did the costumes, and they were great. The bee costumes, mm -hmm. and uh, every now they're just men pacing, and then every now and then the nurse would come out and say, "It's a worker." <laughs> so, oh, it's a worker, you know. So, and it was just that it was, it's a worker. Oh, yeah, it's a worker. And then it was it's a drone. Oh, it's a drone. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it played to silence because you couldn't hear it. It was in the far corner. Oh, of the it's terrible. So the only note we got from the network was the bees thing didn't work, so don't do that anymore. So the second show, the bees came on right. and tried, and then Paul Simon was hosting and said, no, no, the bees is cut because it didn't work. <laughs> the third show they snuck on uh, in a sketch with uh, Rob Reiner and Penny Marshall, and then there was a, a long, more and more they're <laughs> taking, their people are in the back or bees, you know. It's like, yeah, yeah, that and, was like uh, a big thing. And then Rob went into a long speech about how the bees didn't work, it's not funny, <laughs> and then, and then Belushi did that, a variation on that speech from Billy Jack of like, oh. you know, you have Hollywood writers, you have this, you come here and we, Great. you know, like yeah. that. and they kind of walked off to one tin soldier, you know, like. <laughs> one and, tin soldier. And so that was then the bees were there. That's yeah. what we loved about that show. Yeah. It was anarchy and it was so different. Yeah. So. And also don't tell us what's funny. All right, guys, that was part one with Lauren, and we're going to do the whole part two next week. This has been a podcast presentation of Cadence 13. Please listen, then rate, review, and follow all episodes. Available now for free wherever you get your podcast. No joke, folks. Fly on the Wall has been a presentation of Cadence 13, executive produced by Dana Carvey and David Spade, Chris Corcoran of Cadence 13, and Charlie Finan of Brillstein Entertainment. The show's lead producer is Greg Holtzman with production and engineering support from Serena Regan and Chris Basil of Cadence 13. 